Greetings. This is a lecture on uh, the metaphysics and epistemology of George Barclay. He's the second of the three British empiricists we are looking at this semester. And um, we've already looked at John Locke, his causal theory of perception, and Barclay kind of picks up where Locke left off. So Barclay begins with many of the same um, starting positions that Locke begins with and builds on those starting positions, but he takes empiricism in a very different direction and ends up um, actually challenging, if not refuting, the empiricism as offered by John Locke. So that's what I want to get to now. Um, let me share my screen. Share. There we are. George Barclay, and it's spelled Berkeley, just like the school in California, but it's pronounced Barclay, it must be an Irish thing. So notice he lives about a generation or so after Locke. Barclay agrees with much of what Locke had to say. He too is an empiricist, but he points out where Locke has made claims that he believes, Barclay believes, are inconsistent with empiricism. So there's a sense in which uh, Barclay is saying Locke did not stay true to empiricism and did not take empiricism far enough. So he begins with the same slogan that empiricists all begin with, nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. But he thinks that uh, Locke has strayed from that intuition in his own theory and he criticizes Locke for that. So we'll see that in a moment. Let's quickly recall Locke's causal theory of perception, right? Again, he thinks that um, physical objects in the world, like apples, interact with our perceiving organs, such as our eyes and that sort of thing, <laughs> and that these end up causing ideas in our minds. So from Locke's perspective, there is the physical world, and then there are mental representations. Now, of course, that raises the question, what is the relationship between our mental representations and the physical world? And how do we go from direct knowledge of these, the representations, to indirect knowledge of these objects in the world? Well, that's where he offers his causal theory of perception. And you'll recall that Locke distinguishes between primary and secondary properties. This is very important for Locke. So our sensations are rich with all kinds of qualities. Uh, and so as I'm uh, perceiving the apple, I'm perceiving red, round, sweet, solid. But Locke cautions us to say, well, wait a minute. Yes, you're perceiving all of those sensations, red, round, sweet, and solid, yes. But some of those are actual properties of the real apple, what he called primary properties. And some of them are only properties of your peculiar perception of the apple, what he called secondary properties. So for Locke, secondary properties are not properties of the apple, they're only properties of the apple perception, the mental representation. And again, had we evolved differently, maybe we wouldn't have had any uh, some of these sensations at all. So which of these properties are primary and which of these properties are secondary? It's important we find out because we have to know what is the real apple like and what are merely um, properties of our perception. You'll recall Red, he would say, is a secondary property. Had we evolved differently and we didn't have color perception, I don't think cats have color perception. At least I've been told that. So had we evolved like cats, red sensations wouldn't happen. Apples would be just as they are right now, but red wouldn't happen at all because for uh, Locke, red is perception dependent. It only occurs in the mind of the perceiver at the time of the perceiver. Now, apples would be just as they are now and they would be reflecting light and all that sort of thing but again red as a perception wouldn't occur round says Locke. ah that's primary and so yes we perceive round but the actual apple is round that's a primary quality of the apple itself sweet like red is perception dependent had we evolved like cats again uh, there would be no sweet sensations. Sugar would be molecularly the same, but sweet sensation wouldn't occur. There would be no sweet in the in uh, the world. So it only occurs in the mind of the perceiver at the time of perception. But solid, ah, that's a primary property, says Locke. That really is a property of the apple. 
So armed with this distinction, Locke suggests that while the apple is not in fact red and the apple is not in fact sweet, the apple is in fact round and solid. So we can go from our mental representations of a red, round, sweet, solid apple to our knowledge about the apple, which is sort of a physical knowledge, right? What a physicist might tell us about the apple, what a chemist might tell us about an apple. Um, it's uh, chemical composition, it's location, it's density, uh, it's uh, weight, uh, it's volume. Those are the physical properties of the physical object itself. So far, so good. So the real apple then would be this round, solid bit of what he called physical substance. Now, physical substance was even for Locke, it would admit is something of a mysterious thing. It's sort of a placeholder. Something is round, something is solid. What is that something? Well, Locke kind of throws up his hands and says, well, physical substance, right? So there must be this mind independent physical substance, which, um, uh, has these properties, these primary properties that we get at through our perceptions. All right, so with that reminder in mind, um, there are the three major points that Barclay takes issue with are these. First, he attacks Locke's distinction between primary and secondary properties. He doesn't think that we can actually distinguish between primary and secondary properties. Second, he attacks Locke's notion of physical substance and finally, he attacks Locke's notion of a causal theory of perception, but each in turn. The first, uh, each attack kind of um, turns on the previous one. So we must begin with his uh, attack on Locke's distinction between primary and secondary properties. Again, recall that Locke claimed that shape, like roundness, was a primary property because one cannot alter the shape of a thing without actually altering the object itself. So re you recall Locke gives two tests for determining what's a primary property or a, and a secondary property. One of the tests was that if you had to change the actual object to change the property, then that shows it's an actual a primary property. But if I can change the property without altering the object at all, then that shows that it is a secondary property. So I can uh, change the taste of the apple by, um, I don't know, uh, sucking on a, a packet of artificial sweetener. And now when I taste the apple, it doesn't taste the same at all. Right? Um, or if I have a cold, maybe I can't taste the apple. Or if I get COVID, I can't taste the apple. The apple doesn't change, but the taste of the apple changes. That shows taste to be secondary, but shape says Locke, ah, that's primary. But here Barclay challenges that. And he claims that one can alter the shape of a thing simply by changing the viewing angle. So consider a fork, right? And this is, I found it on the internet. It serves for my illustration purposes. I just happen to pick it up. Depending on how one looks at the fork, one can see any number of different shapes, right? So we see four shapes of the fork there uh, sketched out for you, right? Now, do, so in other words, simply by moving my uh, angle of perception, I've changed the shape of the computer monitor in front of me, for instance, right? Or uh, of the table or of the cup or whatnot. This is why if you've ever taken a course in, I don't know, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not, well, life drawing, but that's not the one I wanted. Still life, right? Still life where you're drawing and it's, you know, a range of flowers or fruit or something like that. If you're in that class, it's very important you get the same seat the next week, because if you don't get the same seat, you're not gonna have the same a perception of shape that you had the previous week, right? So the shape you're drawing depends on where in the room you are, et cetera. And if you move to another location in the room, it might have a completely different shape. This is true for life drawing as well. Now, one might object to Barclay that um, I might be changing the shape, how the shape the fork appears to have, but I'm not actually changing the real shape of the fork. So you say, look, all right, fine. Uh, if I move around, then the, the shape that I see, right, the apparent shape of the fork does change. Um, but the real shape of the fork remains constant throughout. And I'm merely seeing a, a two-dimensional slice of this three-dimensional shape. I'm just seeing a different slice of it. 
But notice this is an illicit response on the basis of empiricism because it seems to suggest that the real shape of the fork is not something you're actually seeing. You're only seeing the apparent shape of the fork. But if the real shape of the fork is not something you actually see, then the real shape of the fork is something that's never in your senses. But nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses, according to empiricism. So by appealing to some real shape that you have never seen, no one has ever seen, no one ever could see, well, that's inconsistent with the tenets of empiricism. It would seem to equate the real shape of the fork with something that I have never seen nor could ever see. And that is inconsistent with empiricism's major claim that nothing is in the mind which was not first in the senses. So notice the empiricist has two options. Either the empiricist can say the real shape of the fork is something that we see, or the empiricist can say the real shape of the fork is something that we do not see. If it is not something we actually see, it was never in our senses, and there is no ground to talk about this supposed idea at all. Of course, the empiricist can't adopt that view. What's the alternative? Well, you can say that the real shape of the fork is something we see and that we grasp with our senses. But if the real shape of the fork is something we grasp with our senses, then the real shape of the fork is the set of all of the perceptions of the shape of the fork. And if the set is the real shape of the fork, then we change the shape, uh, the, the, uh, the shape of the fork by moving around and seeing it from different angles, et cetera. So in that case, shape does not pass the first test offered by Locke because I can change the shape of the fork simply by moving around, changing the conditions of perception, just as I can change the taste of the apple simply by changing the conditions of perception. Or I can change the color of the apple simply by changing the conditions of perception. But remember Locke gave another test uh, distinguishing primary properties from secondary properties. His second test was I can access the shape of a primary or the shape of the apple, let's say, both tactily and visually. In other words, two different senses give me access to the shape. Well, if two or more senses give you access to a property, then that shows that the pri property is primary. But if I can only access the property by one sense, then that shows the property to be secondary. So notice I can only taste the, the taste, the flavor of the apple. I can't hear the flavor of the apple. I can't see the flavor of the apple. I can't um, um, touch the flavor of the apple. So I only have gustatorial access to the taste of the apple. Likewise, I can only see the color of the apple. I can't hear the color of the apple. I can't smell the color of the apple. Synesthesia aside. Um, so uh, that shows that color is a secondary property. Taste is a secondary property. But, says Locke, I can see the shape of the apple and I can feel the shape of the apple. I have two different sensory accesses to this property. That shows that shape is in fact a primary property because I can access it visually and tactily. But, says Barclay, that's simply false. One does not access one and the same property by these two distinct senses, says Barclay. Rather, one accesses visual shape, visually, and tactile shape, tactilely. And then one's mind correlates these two streams of data, learning through constant conjunction that objects that look like this feel like that. So what Barclay is saying is, look, I see visual shape, I feel tactile shape. And when I'm seeing something that looks like this, I feel things that feel like that and my mind starts to coordinate things. And so I uh, correlate these two independent streams, but it's a mistake to say I'm accessing the same property through two different senses. No, I'm correlating two different sensory modes of uh, information um, through experience. For example, if a blind person who had learned cube shape by touch 
were later given sight, could he recognize the cube by sight alone? So imagine someone who was blind, but uh, did learn through tactile uh, experiences, the difference between a cone and a pyramid and a sphere and a cube. And then as only happens in philosophy thought experiments, all of a sudden that person was given sight. And on the other side of the room were all of those, those uh, geometric uh, objects that he had been touching. And you ask that person, which of those is the cube or which of those is the sphere or which of those is the pyramid? Could that previously blind person tell you? Well, if Barclay is right, no. If Barclay is right, he'd say, no, I'd have to touch them first. Oh, yes, I see. Cubes look like that. Pyramids look like that. They know, he knows how they feel. He just doesn't know how they look until he starts to coordinate. Then once he coordinates the two, he can distinguish them by sight alone. But he needs that experience first. What does this show? He did not access visual shape tactily. He only accessed tactile shape tactily. So ironically then, what we commonly call shape, as Locke understands it, is really more mind dependent than visual shape and tactile shape alone, since it is constructed from these latter by mind. In other words, I construct what I call shape out of two um, um, streams of mental input. How do I access visual shape? By vision alone. That shows it's primary. I mean, that shows it's secondary. How do I access tactile shape? By touch alone. That shows it's secondary. So where's the primary property here? Da, 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 da. There isn't one, right? Shape isn't primary. Thus, all properties, according to Barclay, fail to be primary according to the tests provided by Locke. Therefore, according to Barclay, there are no primary perception independent properties. That means that all properties are secondary, all properties are perception dependent, meaning all properties exist in the mind of the perceiver only at the time of perception. So just like sweet only exists in the mind of the perceiver and red only exists in the mind of the perceiver, likewise, round and solid and any other property you might imagine only exists in the mind of the perceiver. They're all secondary mind dependent properties. So let's go back to Locke's causal theory of perception. Notice if Barclay is right, not only is the real apple not red, the real apple is not round either. And not only is the real apple not sweet, the real apple is not solid either. Those are properties of our perce perception. They're properties that are mentally dependent. They exist in the mind. They don't exist independently of the mind. So, all right then, what can I know about the real apple? Not very much. In fact, it seems to be completely mysterious. But if all properties are secondary, perception dependent, they tell us nothing about this supposed physical substance. But this should not surprise us, Barclay suggests, because it seems incoherent to say that an idea, a perception, could be like what is not an idea. I mean, Locke insists, right, that, that the primary properties, he said, resemble, the, uh, the properties of our perception, which are primary, resemble the, the, the uh, properties in the world uh, directly. And what Barclay is saying is, how can an idea resemble what is not an idea? I mean, if you said, well, yellow resembles orange, all right, I kind of, that kind of makes sense. I could understand how one idea, uh, one experience might resemble another experience, right? Um, the sweetness of saccharin is sort of like the sweetness of sugar. I could not sort of understand that. But how could what is an idea, solid, be what is not like an idea, what is not an idea? In other words, how can a conscious, uh, what is a conscious experience? In what way can a conscious experience be like 
what is not a conscious experience? As a rhetorical question, what he's suggesting is that's just an incoherent notion, right? All this leads Barclay to conclude that physical substance is a totally unknowable, mysterious, and thus incoherent concept. Further, physical substance is non-empirical idea, since even Locke admits that we never experience it directly. So we're into his second criticism now, right? The first criticism is you can't maintain the distinction between primary and secondary property. But if it's true that you can't maintain a, a distinction between primary and secondary properties and they all collapse into secondary properties, then you can't know anything about physical substance whatsoever. And further, to talk about an idea that is physical substance, which no one has ever directly experienced is um, antithetical to the doctrine of empiricism. So not only is it mysterious and unknowable and unhelpful and incoherent, it's inconsistent with the starting premises of empiricism in general. Quoting from Barclay, but though we might possibly have all our sensations without them, he's talking about these supposed physical objects that exist outside the mind in physical space and are composed of physical substance. So this, he's, he's talking about this Lockean model. So even though we could have all of our rich sensuous experience without these supposed things in the way that Locke, um, Descartes had suggested, yet perhaps it may be thought easier to conceive and explain the manner of their production, our ideas, by supposing external bodies in their likeness rather than otherwise. And so it might at least be probable that uh, there are such things as bodies that excite ideas in our minds. So he's saying, well, maybe, maybe we ought to go down that road with Locke a little bit, right? Because, okay, we could have rich sensuous experience without these supposed physical objects, but maybe it's easier to explain where I, our ideas come from if we imagine physical objects exciting us, exciting these perceptions in our, in our minds. Maybe, maybe, of course he's gonna say no. Here Barclay is acknowledging the initial appeal of Locke's theory. While strictly speaking, extra mental objects may not be necessary to account for mental experience, Think of Descartes' dream argument, for instance. Isn't it easier to explain our perception on the presumption of extra mental objects? Barclay responds, not at all. Quoting from Barclay, but neither can this be said. For though we give the materialists their external bodies, they, by their own confession, are never the nearer of knowing how our ideas are produced since they own themselves unable to comprehend in what manner body can act upon spirit or how it is possible that it should imprint any idea in the mind. So here's what Barclay is saying. He's saying, look, um, materialists are saying, give us these theoretical entities of physical objects and we can explain where our ideas come from. And Barclay goes, all right, go, go ahead. Explain where ideas come from with your physical objects. How does what is not spirit act on spirit? Again, this is the Cartesian problem of interactionism. How can what is physical create what is mental? How can what is physical be like what is mental? It doesn't seem coherent. So they're unable to explain anything. This supposed explanation is empty. This is another instance of the interaction problem faced by anyone who suggests that mind and body are different substances, which nevertheless interact. How can non-mind affect mind? Further, how can mental properties resemble non-mental properties? But even more so, what sort of interaction could the interaction between mind and body be? It could not be non-physical mental interaction since it involves these supposed physical bodies, and it could not be non-mental physical interaction since it involves non-physical mind. Quoting from Barclay again, he says, hence it is evident 
the production of ideas or sensations in our minds can be no reason why we should suppose matter or corporeal substances, since that is acknowledged to remain equally inexplicable, inexplicable with or without this supposition. So even on the supposition that such things exist, it still is inexplicable where these ideas come from. <laughs> Never the nearer of knowing, right? If therefore it were possible for bodies to exist without the mind, yet to hold so, uh, uh, let's try that again. If therefore it were possible for bodies to exist without the mind, yet to hold so, they, uh, yet to hold they do so, must need be a very precarious opinion, since it is to suppose without any reason at all that God has created innumerable beings that are entirely useless and serve no manner of purpose. It says, why would God do that? Why would he create all these physical bodies that we could never know about, we could never interact with, they don't do anything for us, they don't explain anything? Totally. Why would I suppose something like that? Think of Occam's razor, right? Why posit entities beyond necessity? And so why imagine there's this whole realm of theoretical entities which we're calling physical objects when they perform no explanatory work whatsoever, they don't seem to interact with us at all, and they remain completely mysterious and beyond the realm of our understanding. Seems quite, uh, quite superfluous. Quoting from Barclay again, in short, though there were external bodies, tis possible we shouldn't ever come to know it. And if there were not, we might have the very same reason to think there were that we have now. So it says, even if there were such physical bodies, we'd never know it. And we'd have just as little reason to believe in them, even if they existed, than we have now on the assumption that they don't. Thus, these mysterious physical objects seem neither necessary nor sufficient to account for our mental experiences. Their supposition seems to be quite beside the point. This is my comment. Suppose, but no one can deny possible, that there could be an intelligence without the help of external bodies to be affected with the same train of sensations or ideas that you are imprinted in the same order with like vividness in his mind. So imagine an individual like you, like me, who has rich mental experience and it has these imprinted in mind uh, without the help of external bodies. Barclay goes on, I ask whether that intelligence hath not all the reason to believe in the existence of corporeal substances represented by his ideas and exciting them in his mind that you could possibly have for believing the same thing. So be clear what he's saying here. This individual has just as little reason to believe in the existence of external bodies because they have nothing to do with his experiences than you have. So why do either one of you, either that individual theoretical or you, the real person, believe in any such thing as mind independent bodies that create experiences in your mind? <clears throat> Of this, there can be no quest question, Barclay says, which one consideration were enough to make any reasonable person suspect the strength of whatever arguments he may think himself to have for the existence of bodies without mind. So he thinks he's given a very good reason to be uh, very suspicious of this, this view. So again, he attacks Locke's notion of physical substance, totally mysterious, anti-empirical and of no practical or explanatory use. Then get rid of it, says Barclay. <coughs> Instead, Barclay advocates idealism. Idealism wants to say the only things which exist are ideas and the minds that perceive them. So instead of talking about our perception of the apple and the real apple, you get rid of half of that equation. You simply talk about our perception of the apple. And we can know that perfectly. Our perception of the apple is red. Our perception of the apple is round. 
Our perception of the apple is sweet. Our perception of the apple is solid. I left those S's and P's. I'm going to have to, the P's shouldn't be there. They're all S's. Remember for Barclay, they're all, they're all some, uh, secondary properties, mind dependent properties. Idealism is the view that the only things which exist are ideas, in other words, mental objects, and the minds that perceive them. So the, the slogan, the Latin slogan for this is essay est percipi. To be essay, est is percipi, to be perceived. Essay est percipi, to be is to be perceived. So in other words, to exist is to exist as an object of perception. The only things which exist are objects of perception. And they have exactly the properties that they have in perception. So notice for Barclay, the world is exactly as it is perceived to be. We don't have to worry about matching up our perceptions with some non-perceptions. Our perceptions are exactly as we take them to be, and they have all the properties we take them to have. Again, to be is to be perceived. Locke, remember, was a dualist. He believes in two substances, mental and physical. But Barclay points out that he runs into the same problem with interaction that Descartes did. Barclay, by contrast, is a monist. He believes there's only one kind of stuff, and that stuff is mental stuff. Barclay is a monist idealist. When one speaks of objects and their qualities, all one is talking about or referring to are past, present, future, or imagined experiences. So he thinks he's being far truer to the tenets of um, empiricism. Nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in uh, the senses. And what's the only things in the mind? Experiences. So what's the only things that exist? Experiences, minds and experiences. So the apple, when I talk about apples, I'm talking about a complex idea, a sweet, round, solid, tart, uh, uh, red idea, right? Perception, complex, but that's all I'm talking about. And when I talk about apples from years ago or apples I hope to run into the future. I'm talking about past experiences or future experiences or present experiences or imagined experiences, but I'm only talking about experiences. I'm not talking about anything other than experiences. Note, materialism or physicalism is another kind of monism, which contends that there's only one kind of stuff, but it's material stuff. This is an aside. This isn't Barclay's view at all. But notice, Locke was a, a dualist like Descartes. There's mental stuff and there's physical stuff that creates problems. What's the reaction between the two? So one way to avoid the problem is you give up on half and you say, oh, there's just mental stuff. That's what Barclay does. Or you give up on that and you say, oh, there's just physical stuff, right? So monism doesn't have a problem of interaction because it's saying there's only one kind of stuff. So Barclay is an idealist. The opposite would be a materialist. Objects are only what one has seen, is seen, or will see, or would have seen, or heard, or felt, or tasted, or touched. So do objects exist? Yes. But what are objects? Complex experiences. That's all they are. Right? Complex ideas, complex experiences. The world appears the same. Right? So we, there is a world of apples and computer monitors and uh, books and, and keyboards. I'm looking around right now. Right? But what are apples, computer monitors, books, and keyboards? Complex ideas, past experiences, future experiences, present experiences. Again, the world appears the same. Indeed, the world appears exactly as it is. But the metaphysical basis for everything changes. Instead of being physical, it's ideal. Since all properties are perception dependent, SAS per kippy, to be is to be perceived. Now, one might object that the wall of the classroom, let's say, imagine we were in a classroom, wouldn't that be nice? But the wall of the classroom is real physical and not just an idea, you might object. Right? After all, I can't just walk through the wall. Why? Well, doesn't that prove that it's not an idea? Not at all, says Barclay. Of course you cannot walk through the wall. But why can't you walk through the wall? Give it a second. Never mind Barclay for a minute. If I were to out of the blue ask you, 
Why can't you walk through walls? What would you tell me? I'll give you a moment. I suggest you would tell me you can't walk through a wall because it's solid. That's why you can't walk through a wall. Fine, says Barclay. Of course. Yes. Of course you can't walk through a wall. And of course you can't walk through a wall because it's solid. But what do you mean when you say it is solid? What does solid mean? What Barclay is going to insist is, it means what you would feel or what you have felt, or perhaps even what you are feeling right now. Sensation, sensation, sensation. When you tell me the wall is solid, you're not referencing some mind independent property. You're referencing a set of sensations, past, present, future, and imagined. What does solid mean? It means what one has felt, is feeling, will feel, or would have felt. So yes, of course you can't walk through a wall because it's solid, right? Um, does that mean that it's not an idea? No, because solidity is a sensation or a set of sensations. In other words, solid refers to ideas or perceptions and to nothing else. This is a um, quote from a, a biography of the life of Samuel Johnson, the British essayist by his friend, James Boswell. And uh, apparently they were discussing uh, Barclay's uh, um, philosophy uh, one day um, after church, right? So, after we came out of the church, we stood talking for some time together of Bishop Barclay's ingenious sophistry to prove the non-existence of matter and that everything in the universe was merely ideal. I observed that though we are satisfied his doctrine is not true, it is impossible to refute it. I shall never forget the accuracy with which Johnson answered, striking his foot with a mighty force against a large stone till it rebounded from it. I refute him thus. <laughs> well, of course, that's not a refutation of Barclay at all, right? Because Barclay isn't saying stones aren't solid. And he isn't saying that if you kick them, it's not going to hurt your foot. Yes, of course, if you kick them, it's going to hurt your foot. Why? Because it's a solid stone. But that's just more, more um, proof of uh, Barclay's uh, point, right? You will have certain sensations right? You'll have certain experiences. Of course, this is no refutation whatsoever. It merely shows to demonstrate that Johnson did not fully understand the implications of Barclay's epistemology. So he attacks Locke's causal theory of perception, the final one, right? Uh, this is not the case, right? The causal theory of perception. Why? He's not saying that mysterious objects whose properties we cannot know cause ideas in ways we could never explain, which our ideas could not resemble even if such objects did exist, right? So that whole causal theory of perception is nonsense, according to Barclay. Rather, reality is exactly as it appears to be and therefore perfectly knowable. So there's a sense in which Barclay is able to dispense with the kind of skepticism that creeps in with representational realism uh, of Locke. But after all, quoting Barclay here, but after all, say you, it sounds very harsh to say we eat and drink ideas and are clothed with ideas. I acknowledge it does so. The word idea not being used in common discourse to signify the several combinations of sensible qualities, which are called things. And it is certain that any expression which varies from the familiar use of language will seem harsh and ridiculous. But this does, doth not concern the truth of the proposition, which in other words is no more than to say we are fed and closed with those things which we perceive immediately by our senses. So what feeds us? Food, apples. What clothes us? Uh, clothing like blouses and shirts and trousers and whatnot. Right? But what are those things? Those are collections of sensible uh, properties. Right? They're smooth things, silky things, uh, red things, things. And if I said things, you wouldn't have a problem. What are you gonna, I'm gonna eat some things tonight. 
you wouldn't have a problem with that. It sounds a little odd to say, I'm going to eat some ideas tonight. And Barclay's acknowledging that's a little odd, but he's also saying, and yet I'm not really saying anything different than if I said, I'm going to eat some things tonight. Because what are things? They are collections of sensible properties. But if it be demanded why I make use of the word idea and do not rather in compliance with common custom call them things, I answer, I do it for two reasons. First, because the term thing in uh, contradistinction to idea is generally supposed to denote somewhat existing without a mind. And he wants to get rid of that. Second, because thing hath a more comprehensive signification than idea including spirit and thinking things as well as ideas. So notice he says, well, because I think minds are things, I don't think minds are ideas. So thing actually has a broader um, uh, signification, he says. In other words, it's a broader set of references than ideas. Since therefore the objects of sense exist only in the mind and are withal thoughtless and inactive, I choose to mark them by the word idea, which implies those properties. Okay, so I know about you. Uh, I found when I was a young undergrad, first introduced to Barclay, I found him fascinating. Frankly, I still find him fascinating because I remember I was taking a course on epistemology. We had Descartes and his crazy doubts. Then we come along with Locke. Oh my gosh, finally a philosopher that seems to make sense. Primary, secondary properties. Physics is off to a good start. Chemistry is off to a good start. Yay, we're finally getting clarity about the nature of reality, inquiry, and, and, and uh, knowledge. And then Barclay comes along. And frankly, I found his arguments fascinating and really powerful. And yet the world appears exactly as it does for Locke, except the metaphysical basis for everything changes. I think, of, wow, what, what happened here? Wait a minute, how did, what? Uh, anyway. I don't know if you're having that experience or it'd be nice of you to think you did, but it was for me. But there are problems with Barclay, right? The world seems to exist even unperceived. Now remember, he wants to say, essay es percipi, to be is to be perceived. <coughs> so there's no such thing as an unperceived reality. And yet the world seems to be otherwise. It does seem to exist unperceived. Why do I say that? Well, if you light a candle and then you go out of the room for a while, when you come back in, the candle is burned down. So in other words, it appears as if the candle was existing the whole time you were out of the room, the whole time it was unperceived. It seemed to be existing as an unperceived object. Okay, Locke would appeal to physical substance. Well, the physical substance of the candle exists even when you're not around to perceive the secondary properties. For Barclay, there is no physical substance. How is Barclay going to explain that? Or for instance, if you go on vacation and forget to have someone water your plants, and when you get back, all your plants are dead. Why? Well, it seems as if your plants were existing even unperceived, um, and therefore um, uh, that's why they died, because they weren't being watered, but they were existing. Right? There's another bit of evidence that the world seems to exist unperceived. There's a terrible storm in the forest overnight and you go into the forest the next day and you see trees are knocked over and there's been all sorts of storm damage. It seems like the forest was existing there um, the whole time, uh, even though uh, nobody was there perceiving it. So um, remember Locke would say, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to perceive it, does it make a sound? Locke would say no, because sound is a secondary quality, sound only exists in the mind of perceivers. There is no sound if there's no perceivers around. But Barclay is further than that. He wants to say, no, there's no primary properties either. So not only is there no sound, there's no tree solidity or whatnot, right? So the, even the tree wouldn't exist if there was nobody there to perceive it. And yet, again, it seems to be otherwise. Our experience of the world seems to suggest that the world does persist even when nobody is perceiving it. While Locke may have contended that if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, it doesn't make a sound, he would not deny that the tree still exists, even when unperceived. This is because he would say that physical substance exists, unperceived, possessing primary properties. 
But Barclay insists that this is a bankrupt theory, incoherent with the tenets of empiricism. There are no primary properties, and we cannot have knowledge of extra mental physical substance, which would not explain anything even if such a thing did exist. Thus, things cannot exist unperceived, since to exist at all is to exist as the object of someone's perception. Again, this is Barclay's insistence, that's his argument. So, nowhere was this put more uh, succinctly than in the following limerick. There was a young man who said God must think it exceedingly odd should he find that the tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. So, this limerick is suggesting that, you know, isn't this a problem for Barclay's theory if the tree continues to be when there's no one around, no perceivers around. A quad is a quadrangle, right? A courtyard. So no one's about in the quad and yet the tree is still existing. Isn't that a problem, right? Isn't that odd? How does Barclay respond to this problem? He responds with stanza number two. Locke would explain this phenomena by appealing to physical substance and primary properties. Barclay thinks he has shown this avenue of explanation to be conceptually bankrupt. All properties occur only in a mind. There are no mind independent ideas. Barclay reasons that these phenomena, the persistence of objects with no finite mind perceiving them, constitutes evidence that some mind is perceiving them, even if you're not around, I'm not around, doesn't look like anybody's around, but somebody must be around. There must be some infinite mind that is perceiving the world at all times, all places, even when finite human minds are not. Therefore, experience gives us reason to suppose that some infinite mind exists and it is in that infinite mind, it is because of that infinite mind <coughs> that the world appears to exist unperceived, but that's simply false. It doesn't exist unperceived. It's always perceived in the mind of God, i.e. God. Second stanza, dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad and that's why the tree will continue to be since observed by yours faithfully, God. Therefore, Barclay claims, experience gives us reason to suppose that some infinite mind, i.e. God, exists and that it is holding all things in being. It is the God in whom we live and breathe and have our being. And, and this, this would have been a delightful answer that Bishop Barclay would have offered uh, to the dilemma that confronted him. If one is going to be a good empiricist, then one has to hold that physical substance is incoherence. The endurance of the world then is evidence of God, at least Barclay would argue. Whoops, sorry. Now, uh, that's our, we're at the end now. Um, now, don't be too harsh on Barclay. Say, oh, at the last minute, he pulls God in to save his otherwise crazy metaphysics, but not. No, he's actually done a very good job of showing why Locke's solution is a very problematic solution. And since we know minds exist, Barclay says, it's not that big a deal to suppose there's a, just a really big mind out there. And that is as reasonable, if not a more reasonable theory than that of Locke. So this is what undergirds his idealism. And whatever one thinks of his idealism, I think he really has raised serious problems with the uh, epistemology and metaphysics of Locke. Where we're going next is we're going to look at David Hume. And David Hume actually agrees with many of Barclay's criticisms. Um, I'd like to suggest that Hume kind of does to Barclay what Barclay does to Locke, but that's preview of coming attractions. So that concludes my remarks on the metaphysics and epistemology of George Barclay. And I hope you found this helpful. <laughs>